So I'm here for Mindful Social this week with my very good friend, Steve Farnsworth. We've been friends for a long time. We had a wonderful show called Friday Hangout, which had 95, count them, 95 segments. And uh, did Steve it really? is, it did, yeah. Oh, and they're all on YouTube. That's great. I, didn't Hello. Really, I would have never guess that high. If Mindful Social gets to 95, we're all going to be so happy. So Steve is really a master in B2B content marketing, but rather than toot his horn for him, it's so much more fun to watch him toot his own horn. So Steve, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and a little bit about what you do? I'm not wearing any pants. This we knew. <laughs> um, you know, so in short versions, I, I come out of a background in Marcom and Corpcom and, and public relations. And I, I was always really intrigued by uh, the ability to contact, connect with audiences. And when I was in public relations, um, I ran a number of accounts and, and uh, worked with teams. And, I, you know, really, I mean, really kind of even back uh, before the interwebs, the thing we did really is try to to uh, provide information that 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 influenced the nature of the conversation, and and really what that really is about is like you know I was always in deep text, I was always dealing with engineers and, and that kind of stuff, and and to have them explain well why is this better than the other way, and then try to understand their argument and then put it into English for other other folks to understand. So I was a process of sharing why their approach to something made more sense. And so I, I was always in love. So when social stuff started happening, I, I got into it personally, probably in the, you know, 05, something like that, where I started like, you know, things like, you know, bookmarking services, then YouTube and, and Twitter came along and I, I checked out Twitter and I was like, I, I, tr I probably had a dozen accounts, 10, 10, accounts oh my God. that I that I created and would abandon because I was like, I don't know what this thing is. Mm -hmm. and, and when I first heard Twitter, and this is, I think, a, a great lesson about what we understand, uh, how we understand technologies. First, I Twitter, because when Twitter was first created, the, the thing was basically tell your friends what you're doing, right? It's like, it's like, hey, I'm down at the malt shop or, you know, the bar or, you know, the end up or, you know, clubbing it, whatever. And, and it was like, that was kind of the nature of uh, what Twitter was. And it's so much different now um, than it was. And so I, I really discounted it initially. And, mm -hmm. and really sometimes it, allow, it takes people kind of trying in the wild to find out the right niche. And so I just, I started doing Twitter and I just, I love the ability to connect with the audiences. And I saw from a professional point of view later on, uh, people started becoming aware of it and started asking me to be, help them with these social strategies. And, and content is really my, it was always my background. So I just, I've, I've focused on content because me, social are the kind of tools. And that's kind of what I've done. I've worked a lot of semi and, and uh, semiconductor companies and uh, a lot of B2B software, SaaS type companies. And, and what I do now is I work with them to create predominantly thought leadership stuff. And I, thought leadership is one of the things that gets just horribly abused. But, you know, when you, when you have a topic that you, you specialize in and you can go out and talk to people in that field and, and pick away uh, different points of view on issues. And so that's what I do now. And so it's, it's very much um, what kind of brings me to this place that I'm at today. Well, that's really interesting that you um, started out a lot like I did, where it really was not something you got. So easily. So easily. You know, I, mean, I, mean, I probably signed up for Twitter, I don't I guess, gosh, 2007 maybe. And I really didn't get it. My first tweet was that I was watching a show on TV. <laughs> so, you know, and, and I go back to that first tweet now and regret it. I don't know if anybody else here has looked at your first that's tweet. Beautiful. I, that's, I think that's beautiful. Yeah. So, I mean, but over time it evolved and I finally started to get it. And I think that's Twitter's biggest downfall, maybe that they aren't being super, super successful because it's not easy. Kind of like Google Plus, you know, it's not easy to get. Yeah, it's uh yeah, I think part, you know, it's always uh oh <laughs> I just pulled up my uh <laughs> what was your first tweet? My first tweet for my Steveology account was in uh 309 mm. um that was and that was the account that i kept <laughs> that i kept this is working from home it's the only one you'll tell us about folks i'm telling well you. the other ones are all random i mean like i had i mean between names and and content i'm like i really wasn't quite sure who i was interacting with what my 
purpose was on Twitter. Mm-hmm. So I would do it and I would try it for a few days and try it on and I would I would and stop for six months, six months, <laughs> and I come back, and I did this just repeatedly, and and actually the my Steveology account that really came out about again because of my passion for how communications was changing. How do you talk to audiences? How do you provide information? You know, the easiest way to like really um, impact a conversation is providing true information, uh, being trustworthy, providing accurate, accurate information and making your argument and letting people decide. And so I mm-hmm. always felt that way. And so when, as marketing started really becoming more digital, um, and we, we, you know, now everybody, when they do any kind of research, they go to, they Google it. Right. And so this has mm-hmm. huge, huge implications. And so I started tweeting, um, articles and posts on kind of the changing nature of, of marketing and kind of where uh, and a lot of people in traditional marketing in communications are saying, oh, digital, you know, traditional marketing is where it's at. Digital is just a piece of traditional marketing. It's like, well, not really, because now we can measure it. <laughs> it's not. Yeah. It's it's all, small. Yeah. It's no longer art. It's it's science. And there should be creativity. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, um, but I started tweeting a lot of that and, and, and tracking the uh, that kind of conversation and took off. And, I, mm-hmm. and this is a pl- platform that I completely discounted initially. So awesome. this platform or Twitter, Twitter, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, yeah. I don't think you can ever really know. I mean, like, you know, you look at all the social technologies come out and you can never really know if they'll go any place. You have to kind of like, you don't need to learn all of them, but you should kind of understand what they are and where they're going. Like Blab. And when Blab first mm-hmm. started happening, uh, a lot of our marketing colleagues started getting into it. And you know, I think we all kind of opened up um, Blab accounts to kind of start playing with it a little bit. I think that's kind of good. But you know the, the same same thing. It's like you have Ello. Where's that? Well, that's interesting. You know, because those of us who are marketers have not gravitated towards Ello at all. But if you're a graphic designer, you probably love it. So it's really developed into a graphic design hub, which is really interesting. Um, I think I think that's something that you know you said you kind of kind of watch things for a while, see where it's going to go, make your decisions whether it's going to work for you or not. Um, another really good example of that is Snapchat. I don't, are you using Snapchat at all? You know, I, I again, it's one of those platforms that I've, I've uh, played with and I couldn't get into, but mm-hmm. I'm going to try it again because uh, Adam Helley, a, a good friend of both of ours, uh, and one of my favorite gadgeteers is, has been playing with it. And he's, and he's been doing some kind of more storytelling stuff mm-hmm. um, and I'm, I'm involved in a group called the silicon valley brand forum and we are doing another uh thing in the spring around storytelling and so adam and i actually talked about him doing a snapchat story for the day of and then presenting it at this event and you know literally like him waking up and driving and registering for the conference and coming in and, and that sort of thing and, and telling <laughs> some of the little story and to show these other brand marketers about how you can you can use these technologies to create storytelling so i'm in the process of getting back into it do you do a lot of snapchat you know, I really don't. I mean, I've been I've been toying with it because, you know, just like Blab, so many of my marketing friends are really into it. Some of them like Joel.com. He did one that was really cool today where he said it was a hide and seek game. And it was like, let's see if you can find Joel. And then he would go through his house and he'd say, is he in the closet? Click here to see. And then he'd You'd click to go to the next video clip and it would be him opening the door and going, nope, I'm not here. And it's really, pardon me, Joel, it's stupid, but it's stupid, funny and amusing. But is it marketing, which is where I draw the line? If it doesn't, if it doesn't affect my bottom line, I just can't dedicate a lot of time to it. Yeah. So I have to def- decide. Well, which is one of the nice reasons of knowing people like Joel, because he'll go <laughs> And, and plays with all that stuff, you know. God bless him, right? The guy's out there trying every technology in the world, and he burns through so much stuff, and then finds stuff that works. And I have total, total respect for him. I, I really, yeah. Because people, I think it's like people like him as a marketer. I can kind of just like what you said. I can go. Does this make sense? Or what if I did this other thing? So. Mm-hmm. Well, and and for him, a lot of his, uh, a lot of his marketing is about him as a person, and it's about keeping his brand out there. And people like to relate to him. And I think that he's found some really good creative ways to use it, which is very cool. But I don't really want to do that. I'm just not interested. Yeah, and I don't think you should. I think one of the, you know, it's like, I think trying to keep on, up on all the technologies and the latest and greatest is, is not the best use of your time. I think it's very scattering because you don't know. 
you know, what is this thing? How does it fit in? And there's always new stuff. And, and, and we'll continue to see not less, but more applications. I mean, especially, you know, social is baked into everything now too, but we'll see other right. ways of slicing that. And I think the key, you know, for me, it's always been, um, is to kind of pay attention. You know, I, I read a lot, I read a lot. <laughs> and, and, and I try to read what's going on in the conversations with peers like yourself and Adam and, and others. I try to listen, what are people talking about? What's getting written up? What do I see in terms of people are sharing? And when I start seeing, it, you know, because you can kind of watch people just talking about it and being that kind of that front end of the hype cycle to mm-hmm. when things start moving into like people start doing the investigation part where they start playing with it. Like Vine was a good example. Everyone said this is going to be the next big thing. And, and, it, and, it, and it was kind of sort of, and it had some, an incredible explosion of creativity and artists. And, that, and if you remember when we talked about Vine, I said, I think that, that Vine will find a home with artists. And sure enough, do you remember me talking about that back on our mm-hmm. own show? Yeah. Sure enough, yes. that's exactly what happened for a really long time. And so it's, it's good to kind of keep track things as they, as they adopt and see if they apply to you. You don't need to learn everything, go out and do it. Mm-hmm. But when you start seeing people, your peers start checking it out or companies that you, you respect, utilizing it that's when you need to go and like open an account play with it you know spend a couple hours on a saturday where you get to know and maybe come back to it every week or two to kind of see if there's something in there for you Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's really true i think that you know there's no way that everybody can be on every single platform so how are we going to kind of analyze that and as consultants that's kind of what we are as a filter for our clients to go okay you don't really need to go there now Maybe you need to go there later. Maybe you don't need to go there at all. But, you know, here's our analysis of it. Um, Gail, I'm not clear on your question. It says, who is Snapchat's home? Uh, Do you mean who owns it? Um, Maybe you can clarify that in the chat. But um, maybe maybe she's asking who uh, Snapchat's homies are. (laughs) Are there there a lot of homies? Uh, You look at. um, Oh, who's using Snapchat? Oh, Uh, Who's their audience? You know, Snapchat really is has been. I mean, I think that it's mostly a, a younger audience historically. I'm not sure that that's. I think it's still very true, but I think that there's been more. Um, I think older folks like us have been starting to get into. It. <laughs> and Randy's got a good point too that publishers are using it because, for example, the Food Network has a great channel. Uh-huh. But they also have the money to create those animated graphics. And I think that was true with Vine, too, that, you know, it takes a lot of money to create the things that, you know, all of these different channels are doing. Um, National Geographic is really great, too. Yes and no. I, 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 I think that you're absolutely right. Things, I think video, straight video is in the last 10 years is a great example. Like you can, you can spend $25,000 doing a great four minute video or, or some such thing. Right. And, and, uh, and it will look great and you'll use it and some other people will see it or, or you can, or you could literally create, you know, spend uh, a few hundred dollars and create a <laughs> hundred videos, mm. you know, and, and, and depends on the quality you want to put into it. And, and it's not about doing something bad. It's about what is acceptable. And like, I know that for uh, brand still have this thing, like we need to spend a lot of money on, on, um, on creating videos. And mm-hmm. I forgot who it was, but it was somebody who was speaking at one of the Silicon Valley brand form events that we're at was talking about how they had spent, you know, 20 or $40,000 to create two videos or three videos and, and nobody watched them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had total 65 views. And so what they did is they went out and some, some engineer went to these cubicles with a little uh, handheld camera and would ask these engineers about a question, like in their cube, about something that was relevant to the product they sold. And those things got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of views each. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and so the, the difference between how much money you put into something, creating like a really highly stylized Vine or Snapchat or whatever, you can do that. Or, or you can like try to play with a little bit, you know, kind of see if there's... Uh, an inexpensive option, some way for you to, uh, you know, be creative, play with it, or have internal people test it. Because there are ways to do smart things that aren't fancy and are are, are inexpensive to do. And I think it's worth ex- investigating those things. Just because absolutely, it, yeah. you know, I think that's the thing is that, um, and what I what I hear you saying is that, you know, instead of spending your money on oh we've got to have this high production quality video, spend it on creative. You know, spend it on having people think up stuff. Um, Sometimes that takes somebody who's a professional. Other times it just takes somebody actually thinking, 
and being mindful of the market and how we're going to connect with them and what it is that they want. Yeah, I mean, if if it were, if it were me trying, I mean, obviously if I have, have a, a huge budget. I might just say, you know, you, you you folk go out and do this, make this happen, or go work with my staff and you know, have the agency. Most mm-hmm. top comms po- folks I know they do in house, out house. Um, <laughs> client side uh, and, and, and uh, uh, customer side, I mean, agency side work where they're bringing the agency for kind of as a knowledge hub, you know, kind of a best practices and right. that to teach their internal people. Internal folks tend to be, uh, uh, agency people tend to be more on it because they're dealing with multiple clients across m- multiple challenges. So they get, they tend to be a little more further forward in terms of technologies. And, and I think if I had a lot of money, I would pay the agency to just do it or train my staff. I didn't have any money or I had a tighter budget. I might still pay, I might say, hey, listen, I have a thousand dollars. Would somebody on your agency or or uh, um, a freelancer be willing to like to play with a couple of different ideas that we might consider? Or maybe I would do that internally. Maybe I would just, mm-hmm. you know, if I knew somebody who was enthusiastic and creative internally, um, maybe encourage them to put a couple of ideas or do something like that where you can kind of like do some low level testing where it's, it doesn't have to be a big deal to see if there's something there for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and really, if we're talking about, you know, that kind of content, it's it still needs to be really well thought out just because yeah. something is kind of off the cuff doesn't mean that it's a thoughtful, uh, a, a thoughtless process. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about how one might think out that content. Well, so, you know, it's interesting when, when we originally talked about, we were talking about mindful content marketing and I, and I thought about what that, that means. And if from, you know, predominantly what, so, so what I do for a living, most is I go into companies who, who have a need to create more content. So I get found more and, and create demand. And so I'll go into these companies and these are, I mean, these are, these are real marketers, or uh, really smart engineering companies, you know, whatever. And and a lot of times they go to their content hubs and, you know, it might be the blog or some other place where they collect their content. And I'll look through what they've done. And, and the thing that always it surprised me almost all the time, if I'm ta- almost anyone I meet with has has real similar problems and that, that they have some kind of content program. But a lot of times it was a content program that's designed to to check off the box. Right. And, and so when we sit down and go, hey, let's let's take a step back. I mean, that's that's probably the thing I do most is I go, let's take a step back for a second. Let's talk about mm-hmm. what we're going to do. Let's talk about why we're doing this and what we're looking to get out of it. And, and it's a conversation. You sit in a room with you know, eight or 10 people who are making, you know, you know, there's a million dollars in the room right there, you know, and, and no one's really had this conversation with them. And you say, well, so what is it we're trying to do? And they might have some high level stuff. You go, well, let me let's come down a little bit. We're, we want to bring in more people who are going to buy our products. At the end of the day, we want to sell more stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. I go, well, well, who, who, are we making content that's designed to, to you know, let, let's talk about this. So, it's a, you know, are the people who are buying our product, this is the people who sign for it, who use it, who demo it, uh, you know, budget authority, people who are going to influence it like a CTO or whatever, whoever has a process, who are those people? By and large, who are the top three groups, your top, you know, where you're selling into? And they may be all the same or maybe different things like what's important to them that we do mm-hmm. is a part of our, our subject matter expertise and it relates to their job and how do we connect with them in a way that that highlights our our uh, um, our expertise in this area and that they should know, work with us. And, and, and that's a it, it's a fairly simple statement, but it's a lot of people haven't gone through and done that. And, mm-hmm. and it's, that's an interesting process. It's a little complicated because people really haven't asked, well, you know, who out of the last, you know, depending on the, on the volume of sales, out of the last six months or last year, what deals closed and who were the, who were the customers and where did those leads really come from? It seems like really, <laughs> it seems like basic questions, but not everybody, is, even big companies have, have really done that kind of analysis in a way that marketing can understand. So just asking yourself, what are we trying to do and who are the people we're trying to talk to Yeah, is, is, yeah. is really important. I think a lot of content creation tends to be around things that drive eyeballs. And it's not that that shouldn't be a part of what you're doing, but I, you know, it's, you need to be talking to the right eyeballs. And, and, mm-hmm. and, that, and that may not be a top 10 list for the you know, top 10 whatever. So it may be an interview with some real boring guy who knows really incredible stuff that your audience really wants to hear. Well, and that's the thing is, is customizing it to the audience and thinking not what do I want to sell them, 
but what do they want to know? And, you know, really taking the time to consider that instead of being on that hamster wheel and running and running and running and creating cat videos. So great. you got a lot of people who follow you who love cats, but what do they know about engineering? Right. You know, do engineers like cats? There is a survey for you. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I, I've seen, you know, I've seen content sharing strategies that include cute videos and stuff. And I think that there are some really logical content mixes but if you're gonna create content mm -hmm. you want it to be found on the web that's you know it's going to really target your people you need to create content not only around the related subjects that people want but also that um, are multiple digital formats and that's the other thing which i just don't see people do they think about mm -hmm. creating one big ebook and then chop, oh, chop it up home. and stuff and it's like you know that's just uh, it, it, i would rather do a dozen you know i'd rather do a half dozen interviews around a topic and, mm -hmm. and so i have the video and i can strip that out and make the podcast out of that and i can i can write those up have a writer uh contextualize those or write those up and i can make an ebook out of that that has multimedia in it and i'd rather go forward by planning is than to create something that i then chop up and it looks like a redheaded stepchild you know Yeah, those redheaded stepchild you gotta watch out for them but yeah you know it really is true that um we're not thinking enough about the content and, and how people want to receive it. You know, maybe they like video, maybe they hate video, maybe they're sitting at their desk and they can't absorb video right now. Nobody, trust me, nobody wants a white paper, you know, that goes on and on and on about how great the product is and never actually gives you any answers. I I was just consulting, uh, not, not my client, but I was just consulting on it as a question. Not your client. Uh, your clients wouldn't do that. Yeah, my clients wouldn't do that. I, I'm actually <laughs> pretty. I'm actually pretty pretty uh, rough with my clients. Um, because I figure if they're paying if they're paying me, I better be like really straight shooter. Um, mm. but uh, this, this these people had created a series of of um, ebooks and, and blog posts, and, stuff, and it was all around this really. Um, contorted theme that was more because they wanted something flashy and fun and crazy and it spoke to none of the high level people that they were targeting and, and they were just they didn't care they wanted to have something flashy they could then go back to their board and go look look what we did e even though the results of the entire campaign were, were just painful and abysmal right you know and right and they were they were they were advised against it all the way along and it just turned to be an, an absolute train wreck and that's because they didn't you know they didn't spend that time with actually who are our customers and what do they really want to hear and if you don't know mm -hmm. go talk to those people you know yes please you know the bigger your company is the more ride along you should be doing every every year you know you should be going with sales taking those folks to lunch at, you know sales people to lunch and go what are you seeing out there sales people shouldn't mm -hmm. drive marketing they, they're just they're just that's not their their forte but they can't tell you about the pain points and and, and the questions that they're getting and, and the issues they're finding and who are they losing to when they're in the room who do they lose out to who do they beat mm -hmm. you know and and so you want and what things are they using to beat you out right what, what's working yeah. for them? what's not working for them and, mm -hmm. and, and again you can't sales people are, are they only know the tools, so they don't always understand how everything works together. So you can't let them drive the process, but you should understand what their problems are trying to solve. And that's where marketers need to be. That's where they need to like sit and listen and, and pay attention and ask really thoughtful questions. And customer service too, same kind of issue. You know, it's very easy to ignore everybody in your company because you think that you're the marketer, so you must know what's going on. And you know, we tend to work in a vacuum sometimes and forget that there's a whole world out there that actually knows maybe more about your product than you do because you're in this silo. Yeah. And, and, and it's just that one of the things that um, I think the other problem going back to like, you know, do you, you know, how much money do you spend on doing something? I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I really I would rather do. I would rather do a. Um, an interview and a blog post and a podcast and a, and a digital asset, bringing all those things together that I gate every month, every month. And it's, it's totally doable. I can create, I can do a 10 minute or eight minute interview with four really thoughtful questions around somebody on a topic that I've already thought through. And I can do that every month and I can create the podcast and the video and I can create a written up thing. And I can then make that a gated item. Mm -hmm. And I then gate my ad and I promote with PPC and I could, and, and, and until it stops performing well, I keep promoting all the digital, I do one every month, do one every month. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of a sudden I got 12 
gated digital items out uh, there collecting leads. And if I've done the right SEO, it's coming up and stuff. I'm using uh, AdWords to promote it or, or social advertising to promote it. And things that don't work as well, then you can actually take those down and publish them actually into your blog or your other content hubs and just keep mm-hmm. filling with the best content things. So things that will age out or things that also people get tired or seeing the same thing. So at some, at some point you have to remove stuff. Then you publish that in your regular, your regular uh, content place. And that's possible. If you, if you, if you stop, if you get out of your head about, I need to create one huge ebook every quarter or whatever that thing is, these big, big pro- process. I'd rather see a dozen or, you know, 10 or 12 for the year. Than, than just one big, you know, than a couple of big things throughout the year. And that's what marketers tend to gravitate to because they like to go, look, we did the big thing. Here, Here's it on our quarterly report. <laughs> We're done now. We're, We're done. Home. Yeah. You know. And that, that's so not feasible now. You know, to be able to create one big, huge chunk of content, that's not going to get you as many hits over time as a lot of smaller pieces of content that are more specific to what the user needs. And you know, if you do that one big ebook and then they go look at your social and they go, wow, okay, they, they're a one trick pony. But if you do a lot of little ones, then that hits a lot of different groups. Um, you know, you and I were influencers for the Cisco Live event last year, I guess. Mm. And one of the things they talked about was that they had built um, personas mm. Mm. for 50 different groups. And they market their, they do their marketing for each of those 50 groups in a different way. And they couldn't do that with one big ebook, right? No. And, and again, it's also like, I think the analogy I would, I would use, and it's, is, is a lot of companies like, I think, you know, it's, it's like hunting for, um, you know, how they, they, people will go out for um, pigeons or doves and they'll do like the kind of the little box, the little trap of box or the little stick and the little food inside and you pull the stick and it traps the bird in, you, you got your bird. And, and a lot of companies, what they like to do is they like to create one really big box, with one really big stick and one really big string and one really big piece of bird food, you know, and, and that's, and, and they're excited about it. And, and that's going to, you know, maybe it's the best bird catching box, you know, thing in the, out there, but I'd rather have, you know, I'd rather have 20 or 30 of those things out in the forest doing the same thing. Sounds kind of wily coyote. To I me. know. Right. <laughs> Acme content marketing. I know, right? <laughs> so once they get that, those pieces of content, what do you, how do you feel about content creation through curation and sharing? I think I think the classic consultant answer. I think it depends. Um, okay, great. That's that's good. We can go home. Yeah, now we can go home. It's been said. Uh, it, it depends on on if you find that your audience is in a social pl- one or more social platforms, and um, in the currency in most of those is sharing stuff, sharing some kind of a content. It's not sure. exclusively true, but it's fairly true. And so, if your if your audience is there and and it, like so, just a simple thing like Twitter. Let's say you actually have your audience is on Twitter. You've checked it out. People are talking about your company and or your 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 uh, product space or your competitors on Twitter. Let's say that's happening, and so you believe that it's a, it's a worthwhile channel. It's a worthwhile um, uh, hub to, to promote. You know that that mm-hmm. spoke. Uh, excuse me, that spoke to promote that digital asset. So I think in that case, that creating gathering content together to build that is it also a way to share your own content in there is, is very smart, you know, and, mm-hmm. and you don't need to be a long time, but it does take somebody to do that or, or yeah, it takes effort to, to be able to find good content to be able to share, be that only even if it's a couple pieces a day. I know some companies that uh, have a difficult time finding one thing a day to share because they're, they're so niche and it's hard to find something that's really worthwhile to share. Mm-hmm. That's not being produced by a competitor. And it's always a problem. Always a challenge, you know, <laughs> Um, and so I, I think it makes a lot of sense in those kinds of, of situations. I think you can also create content if you're an internal thing, or if you're collecting a few things that you're sharing and you and, and you share it out to your, your, uh, your emailing list, it can, it can create value, but you have to ask yourself, am, am I creating value where I'm sending my, my, my audience someplace else, or am I creating value to the thing that I'm sending them that's going to create more interaction with my own digital assets? So if I send something out and it's got a lot of links, to, you know, if I send out 10 great articles and they go into 10 different places and none of those are me, 
or only one of those of me? Is that, is that helping me? Am I building that relationship? And the answer may be yes. The answer may be no also because I'm really just driving uh, awareness for other people. So how are you using that? When you provide that curated content, you have to ask, where's the value? Am I drawing people more people to me or am I, or am I sending more people away? And, and, mm-hmm. that, and that changes. I mean, it's a, it's a tough question. I, I, I think that it does, yeah, yeah. Little curation tends to be really good. Um, almost any, mm-hmm. anything. The more you do it, the more time it takes. And then there can be like, you, you're creating a platform for somebody else. Like when I tweet stuff, I don't care because I'm just sharing stuff that I, I think is interesting and that I think other marketers will, will, will appreciate. But but your market is other marketers, right? It's about creating a camaraderie or a community of practice. As it yeah, I mean, I mean, I share. I mean, it's a nice social proof when you know. I mean, I, I don't since I don't do social media itself. Uh, even the, my Twitter account, really, even people go, "Oh, the guy's got a few followers on Twitter," and it's like that acts as social proof. He's got one hundred nineteen thousand followers, people. <laughs> All wonderful, wonderful people. One or two, and, but 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 you know, but the the creation I do. I mean, I spend a lot of I spend a tremendous a to- amount of time curating stuff. But I do mm-hmm. it because I learn something from the process, and, and I'm sharing it with with peers, people that I want to share ideas with. And so I don't. It's not really a, a very good marketing tool from that perspective. It does get me some, like I said, some street cred, but that's that's different. Almost all the business I get. Dr- Almost, almost all the business I get, or all the business I get, are are from people I know personally, or from friends who make a personal introduction to somebody who's looking. Mm-hmm. And how many of those people are you connected with on Twitter? Said the Twitter fanatic. Um, <laughs> probably not a lot. I mean, uh, really? you know, a, a lot of because a lot of the markers I I I. I tend to work with like, like VPs of marketing or CMOs and they, they, tend, they may be on Twitter and they may know who I am. Um, but more times than not, they're not on Twitter and, mm-hmm. or they're not active on Twitter and they don't know who I am from, from a Twitter perspective. And they, hmm. you know, someone said, Hey, this guy does how does high tech B2B, you know, content marketing. And you guys were looking for uh, some new stuff. Talk to this guy. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, so not not as many as I would think. But it has happened, but not as often as, as you would think. Hmm. Well, back to the subject of creation curation for just a second. Um, something that I've discovered is that, especially on Twitter, but also on Facebook, if you retweet something that somebody else said, then the association with that organization or that person is perceived as actually being you. So, you know, when you send out a quote by Daniel Pink in people's heads, they're connecting you and Daniel Pink and they're connecting the quote with you more than Daniel Pink. And I've done some surveys on that and it's really interesting to see how people relate to curated content. Because if you curate things that that I don't like, I'm not going to come back and follow you. I'm going to and pretty soon on Twitter, you're going to stop showing up in my stream. Um on Facebook, you know, that's, that's how it works on Facebook. I think that's going to translate to Twitter, but I think with curation, you can curate around topics that you know, your market is interested in so that when they go and they see that within your social stream, they also see that ebook or that video that you just produced and go, okay, this relates to me. So to me, it's more about, um, percentages, you know, how much of your content are you putting out that's really valuable and how much of your content are you putting out that is relatable so that people come and, and connect with you and they got to find that stuff to connect with. And if all you do is curate, then it's probably not delivering that connection, that click for them, you know, to follow unless they go to your bio. Does that, do you agree with that? Disagree? You think I'm crazy? Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> Oh, there we go. <laughs> I, I, I do agree with you. I think I think the part of <laughs> I think part of it though is I mean I, I think there's a lot of value though. I, I don't I, when someone goes to my channel, for instance, with my Twitter stuff, and and, and I don't think anyone really confuses me for being connected with some of the people that I you know some of the smart people that I I share articles from. Um, though I'm sure it's part of it. I, but you said I think that what you said though is the real heart of it is like that value. I mean. When I choose to share something, um, I try. Really, I don't share stuff for small business because that's not really that's not my expertise. I have 
we all have friends who have small businesses and it's always kind of awkward when they come and ask me for advice because it's like I, I it's interesting but I have it, no idea. it's difficult <laughs> yeah well they're really you know they're small it's really challenging they don't have any money mm -hmm. and they can't I mean they're not my audience so so I don't tend to share small business kinds of stuff I don't tend to work with nonprofits so I, I, I love them to death I don't tend to share nonprofit stuff it's not that I never do it's just that I don't and I think that so the people who tend to find value in my stream are are there uh, corporate marketers, you know, um, probably uh, B2C too, but mostly B2B or at least tech marketers or people who are like working a lot in digital marketing because that's what, in, you know, that's the value that I hope I bring to this mm -hmm. I share. And so I think that value part. So I, I agree with you. I think that being seen as a decent curator or, or provider of good content is where the, where that you get that uh, guilt by association, you know, where people go, oh, yeah. this, 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 this guy or gal is sharing good stuff. They must be okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you look at somebody like Guy Kawasaki, for example, and, you know, he really made his name on Twitter by hiring a whole bunch of people to tweet out a bunch of stuff that was all, you know, some of it's pretty good eye candy or just fun stuff, whatever it was, kind of cotton candy-ish, nothing, nothing very deep, but always kind of fun and interesting. And he got this huge following and it was because he had a plan. Right. You know, he knew what he wanted, just like clearly you do have a plan about what you want to do, um, you know, especially around a personal brand. And I think that's something that we forget with when we create content for our own selves on social media. We can tend to get maybe a little too thin and it doesn't identify us to people so they don't connect with you. So, you know, to get away from the B2B part for just a minute, let's talk about personal branding and how somebody can really kind of, maybe they're looking for a job. You know, how can they, how can they build that story for themselves? Well, you know, again, as a content marketer, everything I see, you know, I have a hammer, so everything looks like a nail. I, I would say, mm. you know, if you're really, I mean, I think this is true almost for anybody. Like we deal in a spot that, um, you know, there are a lot of content, there are a lot of, of, of marketers, digital marketers that we know who are our age. And mm -hmm. we are not a good uh, slice of folks our age. A lot of folks our age don't tend to get on social every day and read, you know, 20 <laughs> <laughs> digital marketing Art. things, right? And so, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm sure that this happens to all folks in digital marketing that people come to them who are a little bit out of the, the loop. And and uh, say, you know, how do I how do I learn all this stuff? You know, because I'm my, my skills are out data. I've been doing whatever for the last ten years, and or maybe I'm out of I'm just out of high uh, out of college, you know, or whatever. I would say for somebody looking for a job or trying to build a brand, I'd say become a content creator. Go get yourself a free blog. What is it you really you know? Um, what is it you really want to learn? What does you want to take? Uh, you know. What do you want to learn and then show your, demonstrate your expertise and then go out and interview people around that topic and create blog posts from that. Go interview them. And so all of a sudden you have, I, I know a young lady who did this with David Meerman Scott. Yeah, she, she worked for him a little bit and she wrote a whole thing about millennial marketing. Really smart, mm -hmm. smart lady. And she did a whole blog around that and then she ended up working. And so if you're going to do something, even if it's just temporary, you don't plan to have a blog forever, start blogging every week, start writing a topic. Mm -hmm. And, and, and make sure you're posting that to your LinkedIn. And so start, because what happens, you're not going to build a huge audience. But what will happen is that people will see, when they go to your, when they're looking or talking to you or you're being interviewed, your LinkedIn profile always gets looked at. Whether you know it or not, if you're applying for a job, it gets looked at. And they Google you. And so mm -hmm. Those things are going to happen by one or more people where you're applying for work. So if you're creating that content, not only are people ideally who are looking for folks like that, might become aware of that. The real proof there is you have this content. They go, oh, you know what? Susie's been writing about mindful digital marketing for the last number of months. And she's got 30 blog posts on it. And and so she's perfect for this job. So I think mm -hmm. that if you want to build a brand, start doing that. If you want to continue building that brand, you need to maintain it at some level where you're still publishing every month or some such thing. Um, it's, I think it tends to be hard to like maintain a, uh, a blog when you're working a full-time corporate job and it's not part of your yeah. You, yeah, it can be challenging. Yeah, but you can do that. So you can affect your personal brand by thinking about like what is it I, I, I want to be known for and who are the people that mm -hmm. know that and then start asking. Most people are really open to being interviewed, um, especially if you have one or two samples already up. 
And, mm-hmm. and you can start asking people for introductions and you write a little thing. Hey, I'd love to spend 10 minutes interviewing on the phone around this topic. Here are my questions. And you can start, you can start building a nice collection of blog posts um, to, sh- to demonstrate your, your expertise in that. I love that idea. You know, I, I think those kind of organic things that feel organic, even if you've already done the questions, they get people to know a lot more about you and a lot more about the person you're interviewing mm-hmm. because we're seeing them like in this context where you actually get to see facial expressions and, and understand what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so when you're creating content and you're trying to brand yourself and you're trying to get a new job, how diverse, I guess Gail had the question of how much is too thin as far as spreading yourself in your social networks um, and defining your your brand. I mean, can you be all over the place? Which, you know, in my case, I kind of am. Well, please y- critique my profile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, you know, again, that's part of, I mean, like Adam, that's part of who you are. I mean, you are always out there investigating stuff. You're, you're my go-to person when I, when there's like a new social platform, I want to hear, I mean, you know, I, I want to hear what you have to say about it. And mm. is, you know, it's like, and then you tend to be on, on social platforms, you tend to be ahead of Adam. You tend to be better at the gadgety kinds of stuff. <laughs> and We're two geeks in the box. I, I love, you guys are perfect ends of my spectrum. I, you're my personal like think tank. And it's like, you know, Aww. so, but you know, that I think that that's, uh, you are an exception. I think that for you, actually, you're a great example of this. For you and what you do, which is being a, a social media expert, and you provided, I mean, you know, you provide, you, you've uh, um, worked for the Dalai Lama, I mean, or Desmond Tutu. Well, not Dalai Lama. Desmond Tutu. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, I mean, like, I mean, you're, you're serious stuff. And so for you to understand what's going and how they work, whether or not your clients need that, you need to actually have a, a much deeper understanding. So, for you, I think you should be spread thin because that's what you do for your job. If I'm applying for a job where, depending on how heavy marketing or communications is, um, it, you know, I, if I was just an engineer and uh, trying to do something, I might I might just do LinkedIn as my social platform and really build from there, or a salesperson. Mm-hmm. And I might consider, depending on the industry, I might consider Twitter. And and I would probably begins and end there from a job search perspective. If you if, if your job, I mean. There's, the next question would be, are one of the other platforms is uh, Pinterest or uh, Snapchat or Vine or uh, Blab or some other platform, would it give me a certain amount of leverage or uh, um, desirability if I had that mm-hmm. skill set when I go apply for my job? And if the answer is yes, and I think in a meaningful way, then I would totally add that to my thing. But you don't want to have, I, you know, I, I could never keep up as many. I was actually looking at all your, your uh, buttons earlier. It's like, I I couldn't manage that many stuff. I have all those accounts that you have, but <laughs> I can't imagine. I don't update my Pinterest. And I don't, you know, I, I only do Instagram once in a while. And Well, I think, you know, I mean, like you said, it, it's easy for me because it's my job, you know, that, that knowing those things, but, you know, just like with Snapchat, it's like, Oh, I'm really, really trying to like this, but I'm not digging it. And I'm not seeing it as a business value. And that's the thing for me. And it's not part of my brand, my brand, like you said so beautifully, and I didn't even pay you was that it's about knowing what's going on out there, but it isn't really about putting myself personally out there. My life is my life. I keep that fairly separate from my business. And so I really don't want to have those kind of, you know, (laughs) like what Joel did, you know, it was really cute and it's really great. And it's very Joel, but it's very not me. We should trash, we should trash talk Joel. I would never trash talk Joel. He'd be so much fun to do that. He's he's (laughs) great. He'd be awesome. Uh, He's really pretty. He's really pretty awesome. And the, the things, you know, like he does this walk with Joel where he goes out with his selfie stick and he goes for a walk and he talks to you and he's got a market for that. I'm not sure that that market would be, be a, apply to what I do. It, it, but, so. but he's a great example. He, he tries out all these platforms to see if they they resonate mm-hmm. with him or not. Every single one. You know, and so that's, I think that that's a, a, an important thing to do. I mean, it's, yeah. And uh, I, you don't need to know everything. You just test the ones that make sense or people you're around mm-hmm. using. For your, for your particular market. I mean, I'm probably on hundreds of social networks at this time. I'm still on Ello. I have an account on Ello. Right. Every once in a while, I get a notification and I'm like, I need to go cancel that. You know, it, it's 
probably my biggest fault is that I have a lot of empty accounts, which to many people would be a bad thing. Well, you know? it's a little different since since you have accounts on a bunch of platforms that people are no longer really using. You probably <laughs> probably active on the ones that are people are using. So I did see the other day that my Plurk account was still active. Oh, Plurk, which oh just do you remember Plurk? Yeah. It's like wow, it was so innovative at the time. And we loved it because it was, if you guys don't know, I know, right? Everybody forgot that one. It, it's really uh, one of those weird design kind of platforms for Twitter that we liked for a while. Mm. But then it, you know, it was in Flash and it was kind of glitchy, but it's still out there. I'm shocked. I'm yeah. <laughs> shocked and amazed. I, I, you know, right now, I think, I mean, I, I still think, I think, uh, like all those, Snapchat still makes a lot of sense for certain markets, I think, and I think it will continue to do so. Mm -hmm. So there's Pinterest. I think Blab, I, with the with the, uh, the functional demise of, of like Google Plus, um, Google, I love Google Hangouts. I think that they're, they're great. Mm -hmm. I, I think that the, the Blab, and, and there are a lot of benefits. I, I still use it for some content creation, but Blab actually has a lot of uh, upsides too because you know it's, it's easier to get into, you get more action. We have more activity right now on on this blab, people interacting, checking than we ever had uh, on all the Google Plus stuff we did, and we promoted it heavily yeah. for audiences and held it at the same time. And 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 I think the platform itself, blab the blab platform, makes audience uh, participation much more uh, easy to do, and you can drop in. Shy of the login problems I had, it's easy to use and and get in there. And it's like I think that marketers will use this more, even though. Um, or brands will use this more. I know a lot of us marketers will sit around going, "Ooh, look at this new Blab thing! Look at all the streaming! Look at Paris! Look at the Mercat!" Um, you know, but I think Blab is going to be an interesting platform that marketers can use, especially since you can record and upload the, the the data, and people can come in and interact. Yeah, and I think the interaction and the engagement with Twitter has made a big difference for for Blab, Periscope too. Plarisco. Um, You know, and I know, right? It, but they haven't. Fortunately, they haven't bought it like they did Periscope. So, you know, I think this platform has a lot more opportunity. And every time I get on it, I say this, you know, wow, I love this platform and I need to do more of it. Well, the, the sad part is I'm sure like every other technology, somebody will buy a blab and then it will just die. They'll take it in the back, yeah. put it in a little closet, go back once in a while, can open the door, see if they're still kicking, close the door. Yeah. Well, or something will overtake it because... You know, clearly with live streaming and, you know, now all of a sudden, uh, you know, they're thinking that they need to do more live stream on Facebook. It's like, geez, really? What was your first clue? So will they do this? I don't know. But it could be interesting if they, you could have a Facebook page and actually embed a blab like thing on a Facebook page with the chat. You hear, heard it here first, folks. You know, something that people could really engage with it could be really fun. Yeah, it, 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 it'd be interesting to know. I mean, I think I, I, I would be surprised if, if Facebook would allow that because they've spent so much energy really um, building walls around their content. Yeah. Mm. And, and I mean, there's a reason like right now, I mean, Facebook, if you're a YouTube, if you embed a YouTube video, it just does no not, views. It, it just it gets almost zero views. If you upload it, including if you download a YouTube video, uh, somebody else's content, upload it. There are people making a fortune uh, and Facebook. Okay, so when I download this video, I'm gonna upload it to Facebook and I want you guys to test this with us, okay? So I'll put it on my personal Facebook profile and we'll see well, if it's any views. You, you'll, you'll upload it though to the Facebook platform though, right? Yeah. That's And it will get preference. If you, yeah, versus if you so I'll test it on YouTube and, and Facebook and we'll see what happens. I, that would be interesting to see if, if, if you get more traction on that. Yeah. Although on the Facebook platform, I mean, with the two boxes, you get enough, um, you know, that the aspect ratio is okay for Facebook. But when you get four boxes on Blab and you put it on Facebook, they end up like little tiny postage stamps. Well, wow. We went through a whole hour and I have lots more to talk to you about, oh my gosh. Mr. Well, <laughs> we'll have to do this again. Do we will. Do people want to ask before we jump off here? Yeah. Anybody got any questions for Steve or me you, on content marketing guys, or who, who's going who's used Blab or plans to use Blab for their their company as part of a marketing activity? Anybody? 
Ooh, good question. Oh. Anybody? 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 Bueller? <laughs> Bueller? I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording, but if you want to hang around for a minute, Steve, that'd be great. Oh, uh, but like it as a viewer, first time. Oh, Thank you. There you go. Camera shy. Steve, why don't you tell people before I hang up the uh, recording where they can find you? Like they couldn't already know this, but they might not. So uh, you, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Twitter as Steveology. There you go. And your blog? You know, I actually in the process of I actually abandoned my old blog and in the process of moving it. So I, I don't have a blog right now. Didn't he just tell us to all blog? I did, day? but I actually moved it. So I was on, <laughs> the other thing was I was on WordPress. Uh, WordPress mm. hosted I know. A blog for years, which is like the opposite of what I would ever tell a client. And and so out of <laughs> out of out of pure shaming for my colleagues, I, I've actually bought a domain in the process of actually building a website with a blog on it. Mm. Yeah, it, it's a big challenge to to start over a blog, and, and you know, I I give you a hard time for it, but I'm kind of blogging once a week now. In fact, I'm killing several blogs to kind of consolidate so that I can be a little more focused and and present in my blogging too. I think that makes a lot, a lot of sense. I mean, if you if you really generate enough content in different areas, it makes sense on multiple blogs. But boy, if you if you're not and, and being one person is, is difficult. Well, you know, honestly, one of the reasons that I moved away from from personal blogging into doing more uh, interview related stuff is, is I find it more interesting personally, but I'd rather interview three or four people or five people on one topic and have different opinions because no, no, not any one of them are going to have the same take on it. They're all going to mm -hmm. have, they may have a similar take or an opposite take or some combination. And it's always interesting to get that kind of 360, if you will, with topic. So generating stuff out of my own head every week and being interested interesting it's really hard and i look at a lot of our our colleagues who who after a couple of years go you know i i don't have anything else to say so i'm no longer blogging it happens i don't think it happens as much now because almost all the early people are are no longer blogging that's true a lot of them aren't and i i think like you know the difference for me with Kill your blog. say periscope <laughs> i know right? but the difference between periscope and blab to me is huge because for me, Periscope is a broadcasting network, kind of like a blog. And I don't have that much interesting things to say all on my own. I don't think I could carry that kind of a, um, a directive podcast kind of experience. I much prefer having a conversation and back and forth with really super intelligent people. I mean, how can you not love that? Well, I appreciate you making an exception for me to join you today. <laughs> Okay, on that note, I'm going to pause the recording and say thank you, everybody, for showing up yeah. for this chat. You guys are wonderful. Really great, questions. Steve. Thank you. I love this.